This is the Language of Business, a show to inform and inspire entrepreneurs and anyone thinking about a startup. Hear about strategies that work and strategies that often don't work from people who've been there and done that. Our host is Gregory Stoller, Harvard MBA and senior lecturer at Boston University Questrom School of Business. Here's Greg Stoller. It's one thing to organize a conference, but how do you ensure people actually show up? We're on location at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center with Jason Rahout, one of the lead organizers for the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you for having me on. How do you go about organizing an entire conference? It's, it's a giant team effort. I mean, we have a team of uh, 11 leadership team members. Um, we have a team of 45 people underneath them. I think we have seven or eight different work streams. It, it takes a whole army to run this thing, and it's, it's great. How are you going to measure success from the Sports Analytics Conference? It's a great question. Um, I think we want uh, everything to go off without a hitch, obviously, from an operational perspective. That would be success for us on our planning side. We already have developed a great content agenda, so if people can walk through the hallways, make great connections, enjoy what's on the stage, that's really what we want out of this this weekend. Tell us how the startup competition aspect of it works. We have a set of 25, 30, 40 appl applications that we sift through. I think we have 13 companies here in the competition this year in two different tracks, the fan experience and the performance track. And then they have a 10 minute pitch with startup competition pitch, pitch in front of judges and the winners of each track gets $5,000. And if my research holds up, this is your 14th consecutive year doing this? 14th consecutive yeah. year. What makes number 14 different than one through 13? I think every year we just continue to build, build on the content agenda that we have. We continue to get um, better panelists, uh, more accomplished panelists, a lot of interesting topics. Um, the startup competition gets tougher and tougher. Um, we continue to make the competitive advantage presentations a lot more analytical um, and, and continue to grow those. And then this year, I'm really excited about the different interactive events that we have going on. So we have table tennis, we have a Jeopardy style events, um, we have our uh, first robotics competition, we have a lot of middle school, high school students showing off their ro robots. So we're trying to get more and more attendees involved in, in the conference rather than just show up, watch a panel. Jason Rahout, one of the co-lead organizers for the MIT Sports Analytics Conference. There are 30 NBA teams represented at the Sloan Conference. All of the people directly involved in statistics and video are here. So the opportunity is for us to share information, share perspectives, there's offensive rebounds, there's also transition points allowed. It's really a forum for learning how to use data and analysis to enhance decision making you know, in professional sports. In doing this paper, we looked and studied a lot about the dynamics of the game as the lead is changing. Analytics have played a role for a long time. We've been looking at numbers since they started keeping score, you know, so it's, it's not always been a traditional box score. Everybody's trying to stay on the forefront. It's like Google versus uh, Apple, how do you stay in the forefront and get the best data at the best time to make the best decisions, either on the basketball side in terms of player personnel or on the coaching side? My first impression is there's some very, very smart people here. You know, the panels are one thing, but when you get into the back rooms here and hear some of the research papers and things like that, these guys are really bright. I like the things they're getting into. Losing indeed is a strong motivator for these guys. So what does this mean? So let me give you an idea of someone who really, really hates to lose. This is Kobe Bryant's usage plot. On the y-axis here is the fraction of the Lakers shots Kobe Bryant takes when he's on the court. We try to apply data and information to every decision we make. Every trade, every move, everything we do, we apply some amount of data and information to try and help us make a better decision. It's beyond the numbers. You want coaches, assistant coaches, your front office people, your, everybody should be analytical type of people. In terms of analytics, we use it extensively into our draft process and free agency. It's no longer a niche market. Basically, if you're not doing this at a high level, you're falling behind. The first conference had a tenth as many people. We were just in little classrooms at MIT's campus, and now we're in this huge convention center, and, and you went from just having a couple of teams using it to more than half the league now that are really seriously invested in it. There's so much focus on analytics for teams, but we need to begin spending more time on analytics for leagues, which is how to grow in the aggregate. 
It's just fantastic to see what else is happening in the industry with data and with analytics. So from our standpoint, it's just a great learning experience from a league standpoint and a team standpoint. Once the ball is uh, in the air, we see that Michael Petrus actually already started moving back and Greg Sisma moved forward. But what we've seen recently is the fact that these statistics that the teams just normally refer to in the hallway are now being surfaced for fans and NBA.com stats is a really important example of that. What we're going to try and do on this website is take fans into this world of analytics. You know, as we're talking about going forward, what's going to separate teams like it does in every other area of life is how you use the information. There's great information, and I think what we have to do is really sort through it, find out what's valuable, and use that to either help us validate what we're already doing or to change our thinking a little bit. It's one thing to be a fan, but how do you relate to them, especially in this digital age? We're on location virtually with Quentin Porter, who is the VP of North American Sales and Operations for Pico. Welcome back, I should say, to the Language of Business. Thank you, Greg. Great to be back. So what exactly does Pico do? Yeah, so Pico is a SaaS platform. Um, also, we provide services around the technology, but it's a SaaS platform that um, runs digital activations, really fun things for fans to do. Sports is our focus right now um, on the channels that they prefer to engage with the teams on. And we use that as a tool that's, you know, an engagement mechanism, but also instantly identifies who those fans are and captures first party data and communicates with each fan on a one to one basis to drive whatever end conversion or business results the team wants. Are you connecting with them via cell phone, via computer, or in some other way entirely? Uh, it tends to be a lot on people's cell phone. If they're on their laptop, it would be there too. Uh, the key for Pico that's different than anything else out there is that we run natively on all the channels. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, their website, their app. We're never redirecting them off of that platform. So if they're on their phone, they'll be there, but they're staying on the channel that they're having their little experience on. Um, and with us, it's with the team. Um, but like we were saying, they're anonymous, so we're instantly converting them, and that's where the value comes in. Somebody's checking out the Red Sox on Facebook. Pico's going to be able to know who they are and what content they're looking at. Yeah, the fan of the Red Sox would play a trivia game or a spin to win or you know a memory game challenge. And just by doing that, accepting terms and all of that, they're sharing information that helps the team communicate with them and present them with content that's going to be more relevant and engaging for them going forward. We connected in March at the MIT Sports Analytics Conference, and at that point, you were trying to convert anonymous fans into identifiable ones. How have things been going? Yeah, especially in the current state, everything's on digital, and that's where we come in because teams don't know those fans, and we help convert them into customer records for them. So how does it work in reality? Everybody knows that you can relate to fans if they buy tickets or you can do direct advertising pitches. How do you monetize a digital fan? Great question. So currently teams are already able to do that, right? They have a lot of ticketing data, merchandise purchase history um, in their CRM of certain fans that are in that bucket. There's a much larger population of fans that are on digital. So they're following them on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, engaging with all their content. And some of those fans are in their database, but even so they don't have a connection of who they are. And then there's just this huge population, it's usually around 90% that are anonymous to them. That's because you know the social platforms and your Googles, they own that data on those fans and those personas on those channels. And so we're telling teams that they can do better than that. They can start to 
really identify those fans, treat them as customers the way they do the ones that are in their database, bring them into their database and communicate with them more personally and tailor communication with them that, that helps build that relationship and ultimately drive their business objectives. Is it an advertising play in that you're trying to locate more eyeballs or are you actually trying to monetize them to buy products and services? Some fans, I think, aren't in the market to buy things, but even so, there's value there. Uh, the problem is that they don't know who they are, so they can't effectively communicate to them as individuals. They're treating them, well, or I guess they're going with like a just a shotgun blast approach to all these people and getting likes and comments and hoping that ends up somewhere for them that, that makes sense. For us, that's kind of the, the, the key piece is that, like I was saying, 90% of those fans are anonymous. Um, ads comes into play, but we also have one-to-one -one push messaging on those channels. And it's, it's about keeping the fan on the channels that they prefer to be on, identifying who they are there, and communicating with them, sure, with ads, but also one-to-one -one push communication. And we just have a lot of fun games, too. So the fans are having these fun experiences. So the fans just like it. They're having a good time, and it helps the team you know, not spam them. They're going to show them content and maybe offers that are just much more relevant to them. Ads comes into play, but it's really about a more sort of omni-channel, um, personalized approach when you're trying to, to convert them on something, whatever that might be. You started off in 2014 in Israel, expanded to Europe, and now you're all over North America, including the United States. Are United States fans, even anonymous, different than fans all across the world? It's a, it's a little different um, you know, type of communication. I think you know, if you're in Germany, it's going to be very straightforward, you know, very uh, practical. Um, here in the States, we want to be a little bit more fun and fluid and maybe a little bit flashy with our content. So yeah, we, we do a, a our, as a company, not just a tech provider, we're always looking at what the, each team, not even just you know geographically, but each team has a different flavor of fan, but also a flavor of their own voice and personality. And we just want to plug into that and tie into that um, in a way that's going to ultimately achieve whatever outcomes they're trying to go for. Quentin, you played football at Boston College as the quarterback. Given your knowledge of sports, uh, both from a business perspective and as a former athlete, do you think your sports pedigree has helped you in your VP role? I know playing professionally, actually, after BC and, and in that realm where I'm seeing the things that the front office had to do. And, you know, I'm in, in, involved with interviews and meetings with the fans and the efforts that they put in to connect the fans with the players. Ultimately, the fans are almost more fans of the players than they are the team necessarily in each given season. And so I saw a lot of that that helped me understand it from that side, from like an inside perspective. For me, it's kind of hard because I'm not, it's, a, it's hard for me to be a fan of any sport, uh, especially football, because I was in it so much. Right. So I'm like more looking at it critically. But from a business perspective, right away when I was done playing football, um, I really loved the idea of coming in and especially with new technologies in the sports space and in a way that for me, we're doing something good and that fans are having a good time and they're being much more um, personally and effectively communicated to by their team that they love instead of just, you know, being served ads or spam emails and all that stuff. How did the MIT Sports Analytics Conference go for you, not only as an attendee, but also during the pitch competition? Yeah, unfortunately, the, the colleague of mine that was going to do the pitch, this was just at the beginning of COVID, so he wasn't able to make it down there. You know, so we just had to play a video instead. Uh, but I think we did well. We came as a, a runner-up. For me, it was great because I had a lot of really amazing conversations. I had um, Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment met me there. That's the 76ers and Devils. Um, they've already gotten running with us and are doing some great things with us. A um, handful of other teams and, and leagues that we met with there have come to fruition during this time from that. So it was great. How has COVID either helped or hurt Pico these days? You know, you, you don't want to ever spin COVID into a positive, but for us, it really just has been a really positive thing for us because everything's on digital now. Fans aren't in stadiums. And for us, we're, like we were saying, identifying those fans and giving them just fun experiences. So even just the gamifications we have have been a great filler for the lack of content that would be coming from games when games weren't happening. Now that games are coming back, all these teams that started running with us and, and seeing how we would fill that need. The fact that we're capturing data and identifying those fans is coming in, is being really valuable for them right now um, as games are coming back online. It's also sponsors too. So if you look at revenue for sports teams, it's obviously, you know, ticketing, merchandise kind of factors in there. 
Uh, but the huge revenue line on the other side is sponsorship. And so when there's not games, there was all these, you know, brands that had paid a bunch of money to be in these in-game assets or at least tied to game-related content. And that all went away. So teams were really scrambling for what do we do for Pepsi? What do we do for Wendy's that has, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to lose them. And so our gamifications and the value that provides to the brands, not just the team, um, filled that hole as well. So for us, 2020 has been a really great year. I think we've um, expanded, almost doubled our client base just in this one year. Quentin, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Greg. Thank you. This is great. Quentin Porter, the VP of North American Sales and Operations for Pico. How do you revolutionize the fan experience? Get personal, a million at a time. Uh, working with Pico, the, the integration has been seamless. They've made it so simple and so easy for me to get content from users in the seats out to the video board. And I'm just so excited to really show off what Pico can do. The Pico platform powers the one-on-one -on -one relationships between sports teams and their fans by effortlessly engaging and communicating before, during, and after events through existing social media channels without downloading an app. It invites everybody to play. So everybody has a skin in the game. Everybody has a chance to play along. Everybody has a chance to win. Heighten the fan experience, increase sponsorship interaction, and drive revenue for you and your sponsors. In the past, we've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one participation. Now we're able to take that experience to 19,000 people that are in the building and allow them to not only participate, but then also to deliver sponsor-related activities and offers back to them at the end of that participation. Turn your fans into fanatics. It's easy when you have the right tools. They're basically a three-headed monster. They have a social media communication channel that can translate into an in-game presentation that also has sponsorship and revenue generation opportunities tagged along with it. It also has multiple applications that even go beyond just the, the realm of sports. Pico, get personal, a million at a time. Everybody likes to work on their sports form once in a while, but do you really think you can do it via a computer? Well, maybe you should ask Jonathan Day that question. He is the founder and CEO of Uncaged Sports, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you for having me. Your service provides a sensorless app of sorts that you can work on your soccer form. How does that work? Yeah, so we, uh, we built in some machine learning and computer vision capabilities into a mobile application. And you basically, as you practice, you get to play video games with uh, an actual soccer ball. So you dribble the ball around and you move your character on the screen. It uh, tracks where you move your ball and then it adjusts, adjusts what's going on on the game to what you're doing with your soccer ball. And these are on skills or in competition? Uh, skills, uh, so individual practices. Um, and this is one of the reasons we're trying to launch this right now is people can't go out and play. So we still want to give them the opportunity to um, practice, get better and be competitive. And who are they comparing it to? Is a coach reviewing it for accuracy or technique, or are you comparing them with professionals all over the world or both? Uh, so it's gameplay. So basically you get scored based on how many points you get. Uh, so it's self-correcting. Um, so the game is set up to perform if you do your skill properly, you get more points. If you don't, then obviously you don't do as well. And then you can compete with other people through different uh, leaderboards, different competitions, and see who does better. You were first on our show in March at the MIT Sports Analytics Conference. At that point, you had started off with baseball. Now you've transitioned to soccer. Why the change? Yeah, the big change is just because of everything that's going on in the world with COVID. Um, the baseball app is more focused on being out in the field and playing. Um, and we will be going back to that. But given the current search circumstances, uh, we really thought that this would be a better app for right now when people are at home practicing in their backyards. We had also talked uh, back in March about other potential sports, golf as an example, and tennis. Are those on the uncaged sports horizon? Yeah. Um, so the, the third one we're going to do is hockey. Um, passionate hockey fan. My son plays it. So. Um, and it's very similar to soccer, where you're stick handling a, a puck rather than a ball. So that will definitely be the third one. And then uh, we don't know where we're going to go after that. But the sports you list are definitely uh, in our view. And how does Uncaged Sports make money from its users? Do people sign up on a subscription basis or a one-time payment? Explain to our viewers how that works, please. 
at first we're, we're trying to get this out to people so that they have something to do really um, not really focused on money right up front more ac customer acquisition um, long term uh, there'll be things such as uh, skinning of um, your app uh, being able to compete against other people in competitions uh, individual coaching based on uh, ml based uh, coaching feedback um, different things like that this is not your first startup by any stretch of the imagination. How has your prior experience helped influence Uncaged Sports trajectory? Yeah, so in the past, uh, my, my main startup that I had in the past was based on machine learning for government services, primarily Department of Defense. Uh, brought a lot of the technology and ideas of R&D from there. Um, in addition, learning how to build a build business from the ground up. Uh, lots of mistakes that you can skip. Um, from <laughs> prior experience. And how much has your son been a fan of what you're doing? Uh, he's a huge fan of it. Uh, first demo is always him. Uh, he always gives very honest feedback, uh, which we can incorporate very quickly. That's great. Uh, talk to us about the MIT Sports Analytics Conference. How did things go from a networking perspective and how did you do in the pitch competition? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it was a great experience. I uh, met lots of people. We uh, obviously pitched the baseball app. We also had the soccer app at our booth, letting people demo it. Their feedback on that was huge in pushing us to doing that now. In the competition, we were fortunate enough to win a uh, track for the startups, uh, which is, was great for us. Jonathan, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Jonathan Day, the founder and CEO of Uncaged Sports. I didn't even realize what it meant to be in a top tier business school until my first day. And I just really, for the first time, felt like I was in a place where everybody knew what was going on and everyone was incredibly driven uh, to study this and perfect this field. And so I think being in a top business school really means that you are finding the barriers and the edges of the field and pushing them a little farther. And that's what Questrom has taught me over the past four years. The curriculum at Questrom is really helpful because you get to not only study the basics of business, such as accounting or marketing, but you really get to dive further in and to see applications of the health sector and how business applies to sustainability efforts around the world. They really want us to kind of focus it on four emerging areas, and those areas were healthcare, security, sustainability, and technology. Those are really where the jobs are going to be. They really want us to come out from the Questrom School of Business, and like I said, be able to work in any area of the industry. How is it possible to fall in love with a medical test and no, we're not talking about a negative test result from COVID-19. We're instead talking about a company called Finesity. Welcome to CEO and founder Lila Zimrani back to the language of business. Hi, hi Greg, thanks for having me again. How are you? Good, good to see you again. We first talked with you at the MIT Sports Analytics Conference a couple of months ago. And how have things been going? Things have been going good. I mean, obviously, pandemic aside and <laughs> uh, economic collapse aside, uh, things have been not so bad, actually. How did you start this originally and what convinced you to parlay your success now into Techstars? Initially, it was just a personal lead, the need for myself. So I'm fascinated about the idea of collecting data about the human body. That's something that I do. It's basically my hobby. It's not just okay. my work. Yeah. And I've been always intrigued by lab testing because I always realized that uh, the amount of data and insights that I get is just incredibly high. I mean, it's just a lot more than I would get from like taking notes or even, you know, a wearable. For me, it became really like, why isn't it that other people have that? And the answer is clear because the process is very messy. You know, nobody wants to go to a lab and nobody sure, wants sure. to you know, the results. Um, and so it became clear to me that maybe I'm not the only person, maybe, you know, just people that I know uh, in my network would probably benefit from that if it was, you know, given to them in a way that is readily available. And that's sort of like how it started. So our initial partners were actually clinics that I was going to personally. And then eventually we just decided that we wanted to actually make this a company and then just partner uh, and then offer this to the general public. I noticed on your website, it says the physician's visit is actually included depending on the test that you get. So do you initially log into your site and get a voucher of sorts that you could take to a clinic? Or how does the process actually work logistically? 
simplify. So there are two modalities, actually two ways in which we do the tests. So the first one is in person. The second one is just at home. So from the convenience of your home. So the whole idea is to help people uncover information about their body, what's going on in their body, and then in the process, make it accessible. Uh, in person is just because it sometimes uses equipment that cannot be transported. Of course, <laughs> that you wouldn't have sitting around your living room, right? Yes, exactly. And that cannot come to your home, of course. And in that case, so it would be, for example, a full body scan. So that's, you know, our bestseller, for instance, for deep dive into your body composition. But so that one would be at the doctor's office. Yes, it would be right. at a clinic, uh, right. a lab clinic partner. So these are all partners. So these are not facilities that Fitnessity owns, but partners all over, you know, yep. in different uh, locations. Uh, so the way it will work to answer your question is that you go on the website, you select the test, select the date and time, and then you just go uh, complete the test. And then the same day you log into your, your profile and then you get to see your results. So that's basically what the consumer um, experience look like. Obviously in the background, so once you visit the data, the lab, our partner transfers the data to us and then that's how we make it accessible. But if you're doing it at home, what sorts of tests can you do in the privacy of your living room? Yes, <laughs> so that's a good question. So the way we do it to simplify is with our partners. So one of our partners, our biggest partners is Quest Diagnostics. I'm sure everyone is familiar. Uh, everyone knows Quest, <laughs> yes, yeah. Unfortunately, I would say no, but uh, yes. So that's our partner for at-home uh, tests. So as you can guess, these are uh, blood biomarker tests. And so the way it would work is that you receive a kit and it's basically a finger prick. You complete it, you put it in a prepaid uh, envelope, it goes directly to our partner Quest, not Fitnessity. It's processed there. And then again, you get your results directly on Fitnessity. So that's you know, how the process works. And then, like you said, uh, you have the option to you know, call, um, schedule a physician call if you have any medical questions, um, then that a physician can, can, can help you answer. Besides going through trend after trend of the data that you're probably burning the midnight oil around, what keeps you up at night about the future of Fitnessity? Um, I think it was NFL players where um, a big part were actually, for example, had vitamin deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. And that is, you know, a very simple fix. And that is something that if you do a test, then you know, and then you fix it. And it's, you know, some, it's pretty, you know, established that it has a direct link on performance. Now, if I even talk about the general person, so having access to the information, to this basic information about your health, uh, whether it's your cholesterol, your glucose, your vitamins, hormones, your body composition, your metabolic health, which are all things you know that we cover, I think it's you know it's almost not a luxury, and I think we've seen it with the you know tragedy of you know the pandemic that uh, prevention is really important, and being on top of your health is important, uh, and not necessarily waiting until. Um, something happens to actually take care of it. So As I think opposed to being really, proactive. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think this, the more we can get this message across, I think uh, the easier it will be, I think, for everyone. And I think for me, if we're able to even contribute to that just a little bit, I think we would have achieved a lot. Lila, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Lila Zamrani, CEO and founder of Finessity. Support for the language of business is from Boston University Questrom School of Business. We're also available as a podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for watching.